Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this uh, uh, Lawmakers show series. Um, my name is Antonio Loch, Member of Parliament of Madare Constituency. I was born and raised in uh, Madare Constituency, uh, in particular Milango Kubo in St. Teresa's. Uh, grew up there in the formative years, uh, baptized at uh, St. Teresa's Church. Went to Pangani Primary, and then we relocated to Isli before um, I went to Pakro Primary. So basically, I schooled in Pakro Primary from class um, four uh, up to class seven. Then I went to Kanga High School, which is in South Nyanza. Uh, very little information is known about me because I was brought up as a quiet and reserved uh, person. Uh, my political side uh, came up when I was in campus, when I was in university. Um, I was a student leader in uh, Kenyatta University before I did my law. I was a student leader in uh, 1982. Remember at the same time that Sonu was coming up, uh, the likes of TJ Kajuang, Ochilo, Kabando Akabando, and the rest. That, that movement, that renaissance, the movement for multipartism, uh, similar fights were being uh, recreated in Kenyatta University in Egerton and Moi. And I was leading that movement in Kenyatta University. That's when my political and, if you wish, uh, public side uh, started coming up. So I was Secretary General for about three or, or so years. Um, later on, I took up law. Um, and it is there that I developed uh, interest uh, in public life, public law. A lot of the law that I took when I established my farm, I, I, I first started practicing uh, with pupillage at the farm of PLO Lumumba and Muma Advocates and then I branched off and started ATL Watch and Company Advocates. Uh, it's at the same time that the move for change the constitution, uh, the Bomers draft and uh, the Waco draft and eventually that draft. So I, I took part in a lot of civic education, uh, a lot of meetings, most of which were back in my constituency where I was born. I used to get a lot of invitations from groups, social justice group, para legal groups, uh, you know, they want to know more about their rights, especially social justice, uh, what does the constitution portend uh, to them in terms of economic, social and cultural rights. There's a lot of um, police brutality and abuse. Uh, and so they wanted to know lots of things about this new constitution. And I found myself in that space where I was doing a lot of um, civic education and giving talks to schools and forums. When um, the constitution was passed, I found myself again in the space where there's a lot of litigation at the nascent stages of uh, the Constitution of Kenya 2010. There were lots of breaches uh, by the administration, appointments being done without due process, without public participation, without uh, adherence to the Constitution. The space that now is occupied by Omutata, Oluochir and the other people, if you go back in history, I'm sure you, you probably have said the very little information is there out about me. But if you go into uh, the justice corridors, you will find a lot of cases that I did out of public interest against the appointment of um, Kiriako Tobiko at that particular time and some judges, uh, Al Nasir, who is now retired. Um, and a lot of things that challenged appointments and the manner in which government was conducting itself. Uh, so I did a lot of that and that thrust me into uh, public life and at the same time doing a lot of things with my constituents. So a lot of breaches that came, you know, individual petitions, group petitions, uh, class uh, cases, I did a lot of that. But I have deliberately separated my private life from the lawmaker. Uh, so I'm in the public space uh, in terms of being a member of parliament and the other things that I do. But uh, if you're asking about my, 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 my family, children, they're deliberately shielded from uh, the rigors, uh, the rough and tumble of, of politics. So that, you know, uh, it's up to uh, me to deal with the rough of it. And I like to shield my family from this. So I deliberately keep my family uh, life and my personal life. So I don't have uh, a social media loud life outside of my public life and that is very deliberately calculated. Um, I wanted to do what I was doing in the corridors of power, now from the lawmaker's side. 
I challenged a lot of law that I thought were brought that were punitive, not properly made. And so being on this side of um, parliament allowed me to think through legislation from the lens of the common person, social justice issues, issues to do with the, the welfare of young people. And so a lot of what I was doing with my people in Madari, in the slums, in the public space, in petitions, in courts, I now tried to take them up. Um, if you see a lot of pieces of legislation, draft legislations that have not made it to the floor of the house, a lot of them have to do with either water, health, sanitation, uh, social security. And so I brought uh, an amendment to the Health Act and uh, attempted to create a chapter there that was uh, access to health rights. And basically the whole idea was to try and entrench Article 43 of the Constitution, which talks about the right to emergency care, you know, right to social security. And this was informed by a lot of my people in the constituency who would end up in hospitals and then not being able to pay bills. I see now that the government has taken up the whole idea of universal health care. And I know that the uh, Right Honorable Raila Odinga has made this his platform. He's picked up the issue of Baba Care. Um, the whole idea was also pegged on, you know, Articles 29 uh, and 30 of the Constitution, you know. When you look at that part of the Constitution, it talks about the right to dignity, and the right to not to be subjected to inhuman degrading treatment. So you find a lot of people from informal settlements, Madare, Mukuru, Kibera, uh, people go and because they cannot pay bills, they end up in hospital, either detained with their children, um, and they cannot raise uh, fees. I mean, it's degrading and inhuman and it's against the constitution to hold somebody um, in confinement in hospital after they have done their treatment simply because they cannot uh, pay the, the, and this also extends to people, dead bodies. You find a dead body being detained. I find that extremely dehumanizing. Unfortunately, this came before the health committee and um, they, 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 they gave a report that, you know, um, killed the bill. Another bill that I still will revisit and I will revisit this one, I came up with a new mental health act. Unfortunately, it hasn't been processed past the health committee. If I come back as a member of parliament, I will come uh, back with it. Madare Mental Hospital is in my constituency. A lot of people have mental health issues and I realize that uh, more so during COVID. Uh, this is an area that uh, we pay little attention to because people don't like to talk about them. But people consume drugs, they're in frustrated by lack of employment, insecurity and many things. And they end up in that state in which they have mental health issues. And looking at that Mental Health Act, it was done in the 60s and there are lots of things that I thought ought to be reviewed about it, including anchoring the Madari Mental Hospital into um, removing it from being a department or a creation of uh, the Ministry of Health and give it the status as Kenyatta National Hospital where it will be gazetted. And there are many issues about creating mental health centers all around the country and uh, making mental health a condition for employers to be able to give people leave to deal with mental health issues, depression issues and things like that. I have attempted to come up with a bill on, uh, uh, I called it the National Youth Employment Empowerment and Services Bill. And the idea was to collapse all the pieces of legislation including regulations around Uwezo, around uh, women, youth enterprise, uh, all of these things that give the minister a lot of discretion on how to empower the young people and create a law, one piece of umbrella legislation including the Youth Fund, Uwezo Fund, where now you would be able to put a fund and I, I pegged it at 2.5%. And the youth can then be able to get a grant as opposed to now what they get in terms of um, loans. And young people are asked in terms of Uwezo and Youth Fund to provide uh, security, to provide uh, title deeds, to provide care and other things. My people in Madarin in informal settlement cannot afford these things. So I wanted to make it a grant. Grant in the shape and form of what CDF does. CDF builds and hands over. So when, when young people have gone through technical vocational training, you pull them together. People who want to do mechanic, you pull them together and uh, open for them a garage, equip them with equipment, and then, you know, hand over the equipment to them so that it is not a loan, 
they create a proposal and these things are given to them. Same to people who are interested in plumbing, carpentry and all these. You create a system in which young people can be empowered and get this kind of... Um, and then there was also questions of internship, people who go to colleges and universities. Uh, and unfortunately, and this is uh, something that I would uh, be interested to ask my colleagues on the other side, um, especially Chairman uh, Kimani Chungwa, because he chaired the uh, Budget and Appropriation Committee at that time. I see now they have brought this thing about um, uh, Pesa and Kazim Fukoni targeting the young people. But he was chair of budget at a time when I brought this bill and they killed it because they said, one, it was a money bill. Secondly, they said it was going to uh, uh, incur the exchequer in excess of 40 billion Kenya shillings. I now see that they are proposing a 100 billion fund uh, for the young people. How I wish as chairman of budget and appropriation he would have agreed with me and the young people would not be pushing the kind of things that are being pushed now. So as a legislator, my expectation and what I came in to do was to be on the other side of lawmaking and Article 95 speaks to this question that the three key issues that a member of parliament is there to do is to represent the people, to make laws and to appropriate uh, monies in terms of uh, budget making. I have effectively done that. I think the only thing that has um, been a big shock to me is that the way the parliament and the standing orders are crafted, the House Business Committee determines which law or legislation comes to the floor. So a, a spirited person like me who came with a lot of energy to, and I can tell you, close to about 15 draft pieces of legislation, I think one only now has made it to uh, the stage where it's going to be published. That is the amendment to the Basic Education Act, where I wanted to have informal settlements where you have upbet uh, alternative basic uh, education schooling to be included in the definition of what is uh, basic education so that they can get funding, they can get uh, capitation, they can get TSC teachers and they can get uh, registration and, uh, and that kind of thing. So that's the only, so my biggest disappointment in this parliament is that with all the energy I came with and with my legal background and I tried to put in my drafting skills, uh, you know, with the support of the legal uh, uh, department in parliament, uh, the House Business Committee simply wouldn't follow up, push enough of private member bills. And I hope that we come to the next parliament, this is something that they would be able to revisit because the standing orders talk about house business. They have not said house business means government business. So if we came to parliament only to transact government business, uh, where do you find the space for somebody like me who sees gaps about social welfare issues, things that concern uh, the, 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 the people in my constituency in formal settlements? And so that was the biggest shock that I had about the extent to which there are barriers to the legislations that you can bring to the floor of the house. First of all, um, growing up in the slums uh, made me appreciate easily the dynamics around the slums, the issues that concerns them. I know there are issues of youth unemployment, issues of insecurity, uh, issues doing with access to water, issues to do with health and sanitation and then infrastructure. So I prioritized those issues. Um, and I try to agitate them on the floor of the house. A lot of the times when I bring up these issues, I, I, I can tell for a fact that you know the people in the constituency follow up on those. Recently, there was a case about um, uh, threat and close of a slaughterhouse in Kia Michael. And this has been going on for the last few years where the Ministry of Environment and NEMA has been threatening to close it. Uh, and so I brought a private member question in Parliament. I've also brought a petition. I've also engaged the Minister for Environment. And, you know, bringing this up on the floor of the House um, was something that was agitated for and, you know, they, they pushed by the Somali the community in my constituency. And so bringing up that was one of the issues that I would say, one of the highlights of my issues. Um, secondly, there's one of my flagship projects, which is to build a, a bridge that connects there's one part of the constituency that is completely locked out. You cannot access Thika Road from Juja Road. And a lot of women who go to Kikomba and go to Isili, uh, to Kwenda Kufu, Auko, they have to go around Thika Road or take some other routes in Outerin to come to Hospital Ward or from Mabatini if you want to go to Thika Road, you have to go to Juja Road. And so I lobbied for funds with the uh, Minister for 
uh, roads to CS and uh, asked the question in Parliament and graciously they granted funds and so far we have you know funds in excess of 40 million that was allocated and the bridge is at a stage where it could easily be uh, completed before we go into the uh, next general election. The other issue that concerns them which I brought up and based on you know uh, uh, issues that were asked of me by members of my constituency is question of health. We have what you call community health workers. Community health workers act as a bridge in between the formal health system and the people at the lowest level who cannot be able to access health. And they identify the issues of health that challenge people uh, before they can actually end up uh, in a situation where they need hospitalization or drugs or things like that. And so together with uh, colleagues of mine, you know, we came up and supported a bill called the Community Health Workers Bill. I had drafted one myself, but uh, luckily or unluckily my friend uh, uh, Martin Owino, who sits in the health committee, had also drafted one. So we passed that bill and it's waiting assent, and that is something that my constituency had constantly uh, followed. And of course the one about the Youth Employment and Empowerment Bill, that's something that they have constantly followed and the, the steadfastness with which we have followed and pursued these issues and I hope that I can pursue it further and bring up this bill in the next uh, parliament. So being able to understand what concerns them is uh, a kind of connection that uh, I have tried to maintain and so uh, even with the huge population um, and you also of course uh, learn to apply and use uh, CDF funds properly, uh, ensuring that there is easy access to bursary because that's another key issue. A lot of young people and, and mothers, single mothers, widows, people who are economically challenged have benefited. I think close to about 40,000, uh, 45,000 people over the last four and a half years have benefited from bursaries, people whom we have taken and educated with full scholarship. And so um, uh, trying to do that kind of connects with one a huge population of the constituency. And then of course the issue of security which is also a CDF function. We brought services closer to the people, things like getting ID, things like uh, administration. So in my first year of service we built um, a, a, an administration block for the deputy county commissioner which now houses everything and anything that you'd get on your Huduma Center and what they used to access in Kariako or Nyayo House. You can get your ID from uh, the, the, the district uh, headqu the, the, the headquarters there. You can get birth certificates from there. You can get uh, IBC registration there, the children's services there, the sub-county director of education. Uh, we are even starting a desk for disabilities. So that has kind of changed the uh, access to government services and that is something that we did out of concerns that we saw. The other thing that we are now doing to connect with the question of unemployment is that we lobbied and we were allocated some money to start a TVET and so far now we've been allocated 40 out of 100 million and we are about to do the groundbreaking for that. That would be able to address another big concern of arrestive population in the form of the young people. A lot of people who come from school every year there's a huge turnover of these people and so instead of letting them go into uh, unemployment and drugs and you know eventually causing insecurity we want to get them into technical vocational training and I'd connecting, I'm connecting it to the bill I was trying to bring of youth employment empowerment and services bill when they finish then we have a fund where we can be able to give them grants to create so that's how we've tried to keep the connection and uh, of course trying to keep in touch with things that affect them like disaster. There's a lot of fire. Uh, people live in uh, shanties and informal settlements and one stove that uses kerosene uh, falls at night, 50 or 100 houses would go down in fire. So uh, government uh, can do only so much and sometimes the member of parliament is called upon including you know, using money from your pockets to try and help people and alleviate some of what besets them when they get into fire and disasters. And of course there is sports promotion of youth talent and other things. So this has helped to try and keep um, as member of parliament in touch with my constituents. What I realize is, and the press has uh, been a player in this, is that um, of the three arms of government, the one arm of government that would be able to protect the judiciary, that would be able to protect the people, from bad laws, excessive uh, use of power by the, the government 
would be parliament. So any parliament um, which attempts to try and occupy that space effectively would be an enemy of the executive. So this is what I have learned to refer to as the executive conspiracy. The executive conspiracy is such that uh, the executive has tried to ensure that parliament is constantly kept under check. And uh, by keeping it under check is uh, ensuring that any time parliamentarians do anything that appear to uh, deal with questions of welfare of parliament, there is a conspiracy the media to call them names, conspiracy to incite the people against the uh, members of parliament, conspiracy to ensure that the Salaries and Remuneration Commission uh, stands in the way of uh, parliamentarians trying to look at uh, their own welfare. So these are things that I, um, I think um, I have learned to try and demystify in terms of what are the workings of the member of parliament and what are the steps that the executive takes to ensure that they keep parliament in check so that it is not be able to um, work effectively. The other part of this conspiracy has been aided by the judiciary itself. And that's part of what I was raising in, in, uh, in, in the judiciary forum with members of parliament. That the judiciary is constantly getting into the space of lawmaking and legislation prematurely. And prematurely meaning that um, before a, a bill becomes law. It is not the business of the judiciary to enter into that arena and quickly churn injunctions and stay orders of law that have not crystallized. You know it was Alex, uh, uh, Madison who said that you know it is distinctly the role of the judicial department to say what the law is. But what he didn't say and which I think the judiciary must doubtlessly be aware of is that a law can only be challenged at the tail end. You can come and declare its unconstitutionality and say that procedure was not followed, public participation was not followed, the constitution was breached, but you must wait. You must wait until the process of the lawmaking is done, until members of parliament have passed it after the third reading and the committee of the whole house and the president has assented to it. Only then can you now play the role of uh, the judiciary in terms of interpretation uh, conceived under Article 165 of the Constitution. But um, the judiciary has, has made it very difficult for Parliament to be able to play its role under Article 94 and 95. And so when you combine this conspiracy between the executive constantly ensuring that Parliament is kept under check, uh, partly underfunded, uh, issues of its welfare, uh, uh, brought to the public in terms of parliamentarians are constantly uh, awarding themselves salaries and allowances and other things. If you look at the budget and how budget is allocated, the uh, parliament occupies less than 5% of that. 80 or 85% is controlled by the executive. The counties, uh, county governments, perhaps 14 to 15%. So people don't look at the amount of waste and money in terms of the salaries, the allowances, and other things that are controlled by the executive itself. But any time that the parliament, and in the discharge of their duties, they need facilitation. They need to be facilitated in terms of their role of representation. And remember, they have three roles. There's the lawmaking role, which we do in parliament. There is the, uh, the, the, the budget uh, uh, making role and there is representation. So all these roles have uh, to find their way in terms of um, uh, budgetary facilitation. I will give you an example. If I want to go today to listen to my constituents, Parliament does not facilitate me in terms of movement to my constituency, assembling the people, seeing how they get there and back to where they are, how that meeting takes place, security, it is assumed that the Member of Parliament must find a way of doing that. How do you carry your role of representation? And these are some of the things that we thought that needs to be addressed. So when you look at what I've called the executive conspiracy, aided by the other two arms of government, you will find that uh, uh, the role of the Member of Parliament has been stifled, has been stifled so much that you can only achieve so much in terms of the role of uh, uh, under the constitution? Uh, first of all, I think um, uh, the duty 
to ensure good leadership, the duty to ensure that you elect uh, quality people is something that people need to get involved with from now at the time when political parties are carrying out their primaries. Because at the time when you go to vote at the national elections on the 8th or the 9th of August, at that time, a lot of the processes in terms of saving, retaining or dropping quality leadership, that opportunity is already gone. Unfortunately, young people and even middle class, I am afraid to say even middle class, the middle class are the most vocal about bad leadership, bad governance, corruption, but they are the people who keep themselves detached from the process of political party nomination. If you look at what happens in the US and in Europe, um, the middle class have taken charge of these political parties and drive the agenda of these political parties. So that when a party is called the Democratic Party, there are certain ideals that are associated with it, and people who run under its ticket from president to the member of parliament are required to have a certain pedigree and a certain line that resonates with their political party. So if I, I, I look at the missing link, where our young people, and I'm including here the middle class as well, young middle class, are missing the point in terms of good governance, leadership, and following parliamentary business, is that we detach ourselves from the point of electing, nominating our leaders at the point of nomination. Because then now you have quality choices at the time of election. But because we don't do this, a lot of people uh, crook or craft their ways through perhaps through electoral violence during nomination, perhaps through um, favoritism, you name it, whatever it is that allows you to get into uh, a ticket. Uh, by the time you are electing, your choices are already very limited. So if they are not interested at the primary level, you can tell them that even at the parliamentary level, they only get involved when there is a scandal. You tell me that there is something that parliamentarians have done wrong. They are trying to uh, add their salaries or they have uh, passed a law uh, that perhaps uh, will add fuel levy. When there is a screaming headline, that's the only time they engage themselves in parliamentary business. But there is a lot of business that affect diversities ought to be able to, to follow, but they don't. People look for scandal, people look for screaming headlines. That is when they follow parliamentary business. Um, at the height of post-election, uh, 2013, after the elections, um, the elections were bungled and uh, uh, it's not uh, uh, um, a secret. I was at the height of, I'm talking about 2013, I was uh, at the very center of the NASA legal team, the court legal team, and I was constantly in court <coughs> filing cases for uh, the ODM party and the NASA affiliate and the court affiliates. And uh, when I was elected into parliament, the first uh, order of business before I was even sworn in was uh, to be inducted into the IEBC uh, Black Mondays. Every time it was a Monday like today, you knew that uh, this was a day to come and face tear gas in town. Uh, and eventually, uh, I, I, I even broke my leg in one of those incidences at the time when uh, the Right Honorable Raila Odinga came back to the US. Uh, after the long processions and the tear gas and the canisters and the waters that we faced, um, about um, 18 or so people in my constituency and Ruaraka were killed uh, in what appeared to be a revenge. Uh, so we went there with the Prime Minister and the court teams. And uh, again it was tear gas and it was canisters and it was guns being fired. And uh, you know, eventually I lost my leg and was in uh, hospital for close to about a month. So I think they fondly refer to me as Tiegas because of the role, the front line I took and eventually the prize I think that I paid at the time of uh, post-election. I like to exercise a lot. I, I, I spend a lot of time in the gym. So it's my way of trying to unpack. Uh, when I go to the gym, I put up my phones and put up music and do a one hour, one and a half hours workout. So that's one way that I, and I like to take long drives. Uh, that helps me also to unwind. I like listening to music. Uh, being in the public space has kind of, I like to dance as well, but being um, uh, in the public space, uh, I have uh, limited that interaction for obvious reasons uh, to not to try and, uh, you know, get myself into negative kind of publicity. I, I read, I like to read a lot and I also um, spend time traveling.